to be part of this great institution called the University of Ghana. And I'm so thankful that you have given me a home here in the Institute of African Studies for the past two years. I must give my thanks to the university, the people of Ghana, and the traditions of Kwame Nkrumah for the time that I spent here. I remember going to the first meeting of the Institute when I came in 2016 and I thought to myself, how much better is it to be in a setting where the thinking, the planning and the organization of this institution is for the upliftment of the African peoples everywhere. So for my brothers and sisters who are sitting here from the Institute of African Studies, I want to thank you for making me part of your life for the past two years. And for those in the Institute who said, like my brother out there who's already said, our own Kwame Kuma chair, <laughs> which, which gave them a sense of ownership, I did not mind one bit. And um, the director of the Institute, I want to thank you very much for ensuring that we worked collectively within the Institute. Uh, the Vice Chancellor has been gracious in many occasions in welcoming us to his home and welcoming us. And whenever the Vice Chancellor encountered us on the road, he would stop his car and he wanted to make sure that we were part of the university community. So I want to thank you for extending yourself to supporting the Kwame Nkrumah Chair in the Institute of African Studies. I could take all the time in this lecture thanking everybody and I do need to thank so many people. My, um, my younger brother, the first Kwame Nkrumah Chair is here and um, he was one of those who encouraged me to say you would never regret doing this as a Kwame Nkrumah Chair. So Kofi, thank you so much for that encouragement. And I, I want to thank all those who came from far and near. My dear sister, please, my comrade, please stand up you can see who you are. Please. This, this is my partner, um, Makini Roy Campbell, uh, who we've been in trenches together for a very long time. And um, in the trenches, we have seen good and we have seen bad, and this is part of the good in our lives. Now, um, the rest of our community is well represented here. Um, Sister Zinga from the rest of our community, and Brother Ras Bosco. Please, Ras Bosco, please let the people see who you are, because the rest of our has been the anchor for what we have done here at the Farming Village here. And whenever we ran into any difficulty, we could always call on the network. And I don't think people understand the wide and important network that Rastafari has, especially on the cultural front and the depth of this movement. And so Rastafari, thank you for taking the extra time. And please, for my brethren and sisters who could not be here, hear them up here and I and show them that Rastafari is still here. If I missed out anyone, please forgive me. Um, and of course, the former vice chancellors, you're all here. And my brother, my elder brother, Aki, who worked so hard with us and will continue to work with us, even though. Um, so I, 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 I could spend all the time talking about what this has meant to me the people in the night market, the people in the market, but they <laughs> um, I, 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 I want to thank especially the, the youths in the Institute who I work so closely with. I see Nelly who came all the way from um, Kumasi for this lecture and I think that is a testament to support and for Fred and Philip. Uh, Fred, please stand, please. And Philip, where is Philip? Not do the work.
work of the Kwame Nkrumah chair um, with all, all of you. Fred, have I missed anybody out, Fred? <laughs> okay. I am going to share with you some of my thoughts. Um, yeah, I did miss out the, the, the provost of the college, didn't I? Um, the provost of the college, I would go to his office and ask him for favors, and he would, um, he would readily think of ways to grant those favors because as the, the college, he wanted to see the Kwame from a chair um, succeed. So thank you so much um, for your intervention. I, 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 I want to ensure um, that I get some time to share with you my presentation because I want to tell you that in this work, as a Kwame Nkrumah chair, going around West Africa and speaking as someone from the University of Ghana was a great privilege. I was invited to a, a conference last week in Abuja and they insisted that they should put that Professor Horace Camp is from the Maxwell School of the University of Syracuse. And I said, if they only knew. <laughs> that, of course, my being in the Institute of African Studies is, is much far more important to me and to what we stand for. And I want to share with you some of our reflections in the research we've been doing on the question of the role of Kwame Nkrumah and the unification of Africa. This lecture is entitled, The Environmental Repair and the Regeneration of Africa. The urgency of the Pan-African approach. The urgency of the Pan-African approach. Of course, the question of the repair and the question of Africa and the future is something that is before all of us. And as you heard from Angogol, Angogol Ashanti um, has been working and you can see their sign there saying that they are going to work for a sustainable environment. Eric, the managing director, is not here, but although they're from um, a corporation, when I met Eric at the gas station, he sat down on the side of the road with me and was sharing his reflection about how this company could do more for the society. So I hope that the university will continue to push people like our goal so that we get them to see the idea of what corporate responsibility really means. I want to spend some time on how I see the question of the African knowledge system and the role that the African knowledge system has to play in saving humanity and saving the planet Earth. I want to distinguish between the African knowledge system and the European ideation system as represented by the ruling elements in Europe, especially the idea of domination and domination over nature. Because there's a conceptual divide, and this conceptual divide is between two groups of people, those who want to become human in the 21st century, and as Walter Rodden said in his book on the history of the Guyanese working people, to humanize the planet. The question is, how do we deal with these questions in terms of global warming? They use a benign term called climate change, but climate change does not convey the sense of the catastrophe that is before us. And I want to reflect on how we must work with African initiatives for the future of the planet Earth. So the Pan-Africanism now has taken and elevated itself to the level of planetary transformation. So the Great Green Belt Movement and water transfer systems is what I've been researching on. And I really want to say that this has been a very, very inspiring work for me.
terms of the travels that I made, especially to to Jamaica and to going on the lake. And I want to share some of that with you. Pan Africanism is now transcends Africa because it has to deal with the earth, with the future of the earth and the system of the earth. And to have a new social system, we have to have a movement of movements. We cannot have one movement to be able to deal with the questions that we face as a Pan-African movement. I want to start out by highlighting those of our ancestors who've done the work in the regeneration of Africa. And I want to highlight the work of Wangari Mata. The Nobel Peace Prize winner when she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, many people wondered what is the relationship between peace and planting trees? But Wangari Mathai had written a book called Planting Trees for Democracy. And she dedicated her life to planting trees for life. Planting trees for peace. Now, we may not agree with everything that she stood for. Because as I will say at the end of my lecture, that this idea of having um, credits, what they call um, carbon credits, which she supported, and we want to raise these questions and why these ideas are problematic. But in her stewardship, what she stood for, planting trees to save the earth. The Vice Chancellor of this university is embarked upon a mission. It is very similar. I met him one morning when he was out planting 1,500 trees. <laughs> and uh, he was himself doing some of the planting. I thought, what a wonderful thing to mobilize young students in the university to make your university a green campus. And we hope that when you remain a green campus, that you will not allow the campus to be taken over by the sharks who have their eyes on everything that the people build and they take it over. Because they will soon, soon say, with the trees should be my eyes. And so we want to commend the university. So in this lecture, we want to deal with the question of the African spirit. We want to talk about the unification of the spiritual essence of the African. And we talk about, when we say in this lecture, we want to have environmental repair. We are really talking about repairing the human spirit. Malinda Masome in his book, The Healing Wisdom of Africa, this book talking about finding life's purpose through ritual and community. Repair involves spiritual repair because as human beings it's very clear that we are broken spiritually and this break is even rendered more serious by this thing called religion because there are so many religious persons today who have no spirituality about them. Their religion is a business enterprise. And I know in some countries that this religion is one of the biggest enterprise. So we want to talk about how we can repair our essence as human beings. And so as many of you know, those of you who have interacted with the coming from here, we've always been talking about three main things as the Kwame Kuma Chair. Fractals. We're talking about fractals. Fractals is about how everything is connected. Everything is connected. The tree is connected to the sun. The sun is connected to the soil. The soil is connected to water. Water is connected to the clouds. And it is that interconnectedness, it is that interconnectedness that we want to focus on, on how we can save the planet Earth, how humans in Africa are linked to plants and animals. That's why humans in Africa, if you are African, where we come from in West Africa, most people 
have a totem. That means you are linked to an animal. And plants are linked to the universe. And so we want to talk about how we as human beings can live up to the symbol of the University of Ghana. One of the symbols of the Nkira symbol, which is strength in humility. Strength in humility means that we want to talk about how it is that we will survive with the humility before nature to retreat from the ideas of domination over nature. The ideas of domination over nature, which comes from the Western European system. Ubuntu is a generic term with no socio-economic cultural connotations. Ubuntu, highest among these qualities are human sympathy, willingness to share, forgiveness, and love. Ubuntu says, I am because we are, and because we are, I am. Ubuntu emphasizes linked hum humanity, and there is no uh, or intrinsic connection with the universe. Ubuntu goes to quantum physics and goes beyond the simplistic ideas of mechanics and mechanical ideas of domination, separation, and fragmentation. And it is, the, it is that essence of the energy that tells us that everything is connected that forms the philosophical basis of what we are talking about today. The University of Ghana was established 70 years ago, and this, this lecture is taking place within the context of the 70th anniversary. And 70 years after the University of Ghana, we are still in the transition from the idea that there are certain ideas that are civilized and certain ideas that are progressive. And we take the idea of progress coming from the liberal view about what Francis Bacon and René Picard talks about, the person who is a civilized human being. And Francis Bacon says, the general good of all mankind could best be pursued by the attainment of knowledge that is useful to life and to render ourselves masters and possessors of nature. And what this lecture is going to say is this is, in our view, the crux of the problem. The instrumentalistic and capitalistic values with respect to human use of nature and the idea of domination over nature is what has brought us to the brink of disaster. So human beings are not beings with a spiritual core, but human beings are simply factors of production. The ideas of liberalism identify making profits identify the production of goods as the highest idea for human beings. For the past 200 years, the production of massive amount of industrial goods was seen as a hallmark of progress. And that idea of being a hallmark of progress says that even if you kill the Native Americans, even if you enslave a hundred million Africans, these are unfortunate byproducts of progress. And so the destruction of the earth was legitimized as progress. And colonialism and racism created an idea called social Darwinism. Social Darwin spoke about the hierarchy of human beings as African lives were no longer important. African lives were just as important as minerals. And so, from Mr. Lawrence Summers, Mr. Lawrence Summers sent this memo in 1991 to the World Bank. It's about why we should place dirty interest industries in Africa. This is a quotation from Mr. Summers about why it is more economical to, to 
The measurement of the cost of health impaired pollution depends on the foregone earnings from increased morbidity and mortality. From this point of view, a given amount of health impaired pollution should be done in the country with the lowest cost, which would be the country with the lowest ratings. I think the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable and we should face up to that. Here you go. It's more economical to dump toxic waste in Africa. And so we, we need to understand that this thinking has led to the destruction of what we've had in Africa as the harmony between Africans and the natural environment. If you read the textbooks about the environment, about what is the, the nature, you have different conclusions. But Africans lost control over their lives in the Atlantic slave trade. The Atlantic slave trade, which was visited on the planet Earth, and we still not recovered from the Atlantic slave trade. The depopulation of Africa, and there's a chart in the book, How Europe Want to Develop Africa, to show that the African population stagnated for over 400 years, and it is only since 2000 that African population starts to recover. Africans were disenfranchised and lost the right to hunt, to fish, to work, and were herded into areas where they were coerced to produce cheap labor. And if they were not hoarded in countries like Ghana, they were taxed so that they could produce for the colonial state. Ecological change disrupted the lives of Africa and there was a breakdown of the human controlled ecological system. There was a destruction of the African cattle, com co cattle complex. And so we had what we call the prelude to the ecological destruction in Africa. The imperialist partitioning of Africa, the wars, the breakdown of the environment, and then we had what we call two ecological zones in Africa. Two ecological zones in Africa were the human, agricultural, and domesticated animal zone as against the wild game, forest, and sex supply. And guess what? At the end of colonialism, the wild game, forest, and sex supply took over from the African environmental areas where Africans could live. As some of you don't know, in East Africa, there are vast areas. There's an area in the southern part of, of Kenya and Tanzania, which is bigger than the whole state of Texas, that you cannot carry out economic activities because of set supply. And Rosina Mortitan is something that we should always be following in terms of what we have not recovered from the ecological collapse of colonialism. The key transformations of ecological collapse Rinder pests, extension of smallpox, jigger speed. Some of you don't know that a ship landed from South, South America, from, from Brazil in 1867 and landed at Ambrose in, in Angola and the jigger speed disease attacked Africa from West Africa across East Africa and paralyzed Africa and this assisted in the accumulation of Africa. And so we had red locusts and the more war of Rindapest. Lord Lugard made a quote, says Rindapest has assisted our enterprise. As warlike as the Maasai were, they were humbled before us and at least 90% of the population died as a result of the Rindapest. So we must see how disease and colonialism interacted to weaken Africa some time ago and the Africans are only recovered now. So the geographers and the demographers said in a country like Uganda, before 1900 there were 5 million um, Baganda, but by 19, 
by, by 1920, there were less than one million. And we have not understood the scale of the catastrophe in Africa. So we have ecological collapse, spread of sex supply, which is still with us, spread of capital diseases, spread of animal trichomiasis, sleeping sickness, and the spread the ecological collapse in Africa came with what they said was modernization. Modernization is what? Western medicine. Spread of wildlife parks. Before 1900, there were no national parks in Africa. It was the home of the African people. How many of you knew that? And in fact, people are telling us now that the reason we don't have to save Lake Chad is that we need to have a wildlife park in Lake, Lake Chad. So we need the, the understanding of what the Pan-African intervention did yesterday to recover the African environment. What Pan-African movement did yesterday to recover African healthcare. And we would not have time to go into the plan of resources. There's an important book by Nibo Bassi called Cook Continent, where he's gone into great details about the impact of this colonial interlude. Unless we teach that and understand what has happened to the African environment, if we teach about progress and modernization and bringing healthcare to Africa, we will not have a good sense of what has happened in Africa. It was 30 years ago in June that James Hansen, who was working for the National Aeronautic Space Administration, in the United States of America, gave a testimony for the U.S. Senate. And in that testimony, James Hansen said that the Earth has been warmer in the first five months of this year than in any comparable period since measurement began 130 years ago. And the highest temperatures can now be attributed in the long-expected global warming trend linked to pollution. This was James Hansen 30 years ago. 30 years ago we understood that this thing that was called industrialization was not good for the planet Earth. This thing about steam and coal and fossil fuels had a disastrous impact on the planet Earth. 30 years after James Hansen made that testament for the U.S. Senate, we now know that we've passed the tipping point. The tipping point is a point of no return. The tipping point is a point of a fundamental shift in global climate system with potentially far-reaching consequences. And 30 years after that testimony, we know the consequences are no longer understood in a linear concept, but understood in terms of how the CO2 levels are uh, increasing global average temperature not experienced in the past thousand years. And so, in order to diffuse the anger of the people, they use a benign concept called climate change. And the climate change is supposed to make the statistical change in the distribution of weather over time. One of these changes is global warming, which is increased in the temperature of the Earth near surface, air, and oceans. Climate change is driven primarily by emissions of carbon dioxide through energy production via burning of fossil fuels and exacerbated by deforestation because forests play a key role in absorbing carbon dioxide. Now, the problem is NASA defines climate change and it defines, it defines climate and makes a distinction between climate and weather. I don't have to go into that for this August audience, but we, we know that global warming is a reality in that the upward temperature from the 1970s has been rising and it's over 1.5 to 2%. And as the African um, environmental says, anytime it warms to 2% centigrade, it's over 3.5 for Africa. So global temperatures are rising. And what are the implications that we read about? The implications we read about from the West? Glacial retreat. Decrease snow cover. Sea level 
rising, melting snows of mountains, each hill with the Malayas, extreme weather events. And when you read the standard text on the environmental, you don't get the sense of where Africa fits into this thing. Here's a chart of greenhouse emissions. Who has been responsible for this greenhouse emissions? Africa, which is suffering the most, has contributed 2.5, one of the least, and yet Africa is suffering the most from this question of global warming. We've seen rising temperatures in Africa, increased warm spells and decreased numbers of cold nights, continental decreasing precipitation, impacting hydrological system, increased desertification. We see the fingerprints of global of, 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 of this all over Africa. The fingerprints of this droughts, impact on coastline, malaria expansion, and what I've been doing in my research, the impact on this central part of Africa called Lake Chad. As some of you from the Institute know from my presentation that the images of the NASA has shown that in the past 40 years, Lake Chad has lost 95% of its water with tremendous implications. And I'm going to come back, I hope, later on to give a lecture at the African Academy of Sciences on the question of water at Lake Chad. But we want to highlight the fact that 40 years ago, the World Bank had a massive study on environmental sensitive areas in Africa. And they talk about Chad, but they have not seen fit to see how the policies of the World Bank, the policies of government in relationship to what is called growth and development is leading and exacerbating this uh, question of the climate crisis in Africa. So the, the late child um, crisis is before us and it is endangering life all around us in Africa. When we went to, Peter and I went to Lake Chad, this is a unique species of cattle called the Kuri cattle. It is only found in this part of the world. The Kuri cattle is a cattle that swims. It's the only species of cattle that is found. This species of cattle is now endangered as the endangerment of the lives of the African peoples. And we can see what the terrain and the agricultural land look like in this region today. This tree here, this mango tree, where we walked in the lake, we were walking the lake, some of you read of Jesus Christ walking on water, we weren't walking on water. <laughs> we were walking in the lake, and we drive up. And the marker on the mango tree tells us where the water was and where the water level should be when this lake is fully. So we have the loss of livelihood in this Central Africa region from the dry up of Lake Chad. In the 1960s, this lake hosted 135 species of fish and fishermen captured 200,000 metric tons of fish every year, providing an important source of food, security, and income to the basin's population. During this period, it's estimated that there were 20,000 commercial fishermen in Chad alone. They had over 250,000 heads of cattle. Now the pastoralists are driven from this region. And we hear about the problems between pastoralists and farmers in Nigeria. And we are not linking it correctly to the impact of global warming. This is a satellite picture of forest fires across Africa. And in the forest fires across Africa, you can see in this picture, which is taken from NASA and the satellite, where we can see that all across Western Africa, we're sending up more fires to increase global 
local warming. Bushfires, dear soil, dust is less rainfall. And this production of oil that we have embarked on as a sign of progress is something that is challenging for us. Because we have a crime against nature. You could not do this in Norway or the United States of America. Why is it that we are cutting down trees to get firewood but yet we flaring gas in Nigeria? So if we have two ecological zones. We have two ecological zones. That is one of the ecological zones and this is the other. Because we do not consider planning for the future in terms of how our society should be. And out of this we have the instability which comes from young people who are misguided or mobilized to be anti-people. And this thing called Boko Haram has been internationalized and politicized and it's become a menace to ordinary decent people and we cannot speak in public without speaking about how can you in the 21st century talk about we will kidnap women and sell them into slavery? What kind of country can you grow up in where you could think that you could sell someone into slavery in the 21st century? But this is the bankruptcy of those who say that they are fighting in the name of some religion which has nothing to do with human beings. And so we have this crisis in Africa. And instead of dealing with the crisis, they're tinkering with it. I say tinkering because the Western capitalist countries do not want to face up to the question of why we have to make a break with the mode of economic organization as we presently organize. For the past 46 years, we have had conferences and meetings, the Stockholm Conference of Human Environment, the World Charter for Nature, the Brundtland Report, the Rio Conference, the Kyoto Treaty, and all of these conferences only present us ideas about tinkering around the edges. Tinkering around the edges. And so they come up with something called REM. And they have our universities and our libraries all mixed up in how to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest de degradation. And these mechanisms come from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The fact is, there is no seriousness internationally about where we go to plan for the future of the planet Earth. And so our universities are involved with these buzzwords. These buzzwords. Mitigation and adaptation. <laughs> And we have some thesis being written about this. And the World Bank will come and tell us about we must do resilience. And you know, what, what do these words mean? And then you have, when we went to Niger, in Gifa, where we have half a million people displaced, we have 65 international NGOs talking about how to help the people with resilience, and you're handing out food for the people when you're taking away their livelihood. And so our leaders in Africa, without understanding the serious of this crisis, say we want to talk about climate debt and climate finance, technology transfer. UNESCO has joined in with this neoliberal argument. When we went to the conference, Peter and I went to the international conference on saving Lake Chad. And I get up and stand up and say, no, we cannot accept this World Bank and UNESCO position on the price of water. How can you sell water? What is the price of water? What is where our spiritual values come from? What is it about this thing about the price and the neoliberal ideas about water? And so they're pushing climate development funds in Africa. Certainly. We don't want to develop like China. If you see the picture of what the Chinese cities look like, we see exactly what that kind of industrial development brings. This, this is Chinese cities today. 
I worked in China, and I, the story of um, a young boy, father told him to get up to bed. The young boy is eight years old, and the boy said to his father, why should I get up to bed to go and breathe that foul air? <laughs> and yet, our leaders are telling us that we must industrialize like China. That we must take the dirty industry from China that they do not want and have that kind of industrialization in the 21st century. So we are definitely out of the ideas, as I said in the first lecture of the Kwame Nkrumah chair. Kwame Nkrumah chair said we don't want development. People say, what, Professor Kwame, we don't want development? No, we don't want development. Because there's a profound contradiction between the ideas of growth and the idea of saving the planet. You cannot have the two. So first, when we had a meeting in Durban in 2001 and talked about the World Conference Against Racism, how to fight racism and fight for reparative justice, they came up with something called the Millennium Development Goals. <laughs> and after 15 years of having meetings everywhere on Millennium Development Goals, the conditions of the African people were worse after the MDG than before the MDG. And now they have the successor called the SDGs, <laughs> the Sustainable Development Goals. Who does not want sustainability? Everybody wants sustainability, but what is the nature of the sustainability that you're proposing? There's a contradiction between this idea of sustainable development goals and the idea of saving the planet Earth. I went to the library just to prepare myself for the lecture and I spoke to the librarian because the library is having a big, big display on sustainable development goal. Goal number six, having water. I said, I said please, could you show me the books that have been written about water in Africa for sustainable development? He said, oh well, we don't have any right now. <laughs> Because the agenda for our universities are not being set by Africans. I said, why are we not discussing and having this place on agenda 2063 about the unification of Africa? And um, see the profound contradiction. The SDGs embodied the widely recognized and profound contradiction between the pursuit of economic growth and the very notion of sustainable ecolo ecological sustainability. And as Desmond Tutu said quite clearly, that if we have global warming, we are condemning Africans to incineration. So, the challenge of the research we are doing is that it's not a question only for Africa. It's a Pan-African question. Because I come from, I was born, of course, I come from, as you know, I come from the western region of Ghana, from the Coromantic people. <laughs> but they took me as a enslaved person to the Caribbean. <laughs> and we know that in the Caribbean, we have this thing that comes across the Atlantic Ocean called hurricanes. <laughs> and hurricanes come every year. And we saw what happened in Hurricane Katrina. We saw how they could not save lives. And so we can see the issue of toxic racism and environmental decay is affecting not only Africa, but the African peoples everywhere. So we have an interlocking crisis, an energy crisis, a capitalist crisis, a financial crisis, and as I said in the beginning, a religious crisis. You want to see how deep this religious crisis is in Ghana? Just go to the Sabbath field any night of the school year. <laughs> and when you go to the Sabbath field, you will see the nature of this um, crisis. And I speak to my young son, they say, I want you to praise God, but the God I want you to praise is the God of love, the God of peace, the God of sharing, the God of giving back to society and giving back to life. And so we do not want these world bank projects. And as the Bishop of Durban said, 
The Bishop of Durban says healing and repairing the damage, putting right what has gone wrong, restoring what has been lost, mending what has been broken, healing what has been wounded. Those are the kind of religious leaders we want. Let me turn to what we have to do in terms of our research. Let me turn to what is necessary and the four areas that I focus on is I focus on the elements of our research. Okay. Global warming requires a one to. You cannot save Chad and leave Nigeria. You cannot save Nigeria and leave Niger. You cannot save Ghana and leave Burkina Faso because these borders are not really useful for Africa. We want a new international cooperation based on Pan-African understanding. We need conversion. And as our sisters who organized the Global Strike said, the most important thing is to invest in caring, not killing. We need to build international organizations. Now, one of the foremost tasks that has been embarked on in Africa is called building the Great Green Wall across Africa. Building the Great Green Wall across Africa is one of the tasks of regenerating Africa, and it takes up from the work of Wangari Matai of planting a billion trees. And I see Vice Chancellor, I hope that your tree planting in the university is integrated in a wider Pan-African vision that we can set up a center for the teaching of tree planting at the University of Ghana. <laughs> and we begin to train the tree surgeons because the tree surgeons that are necessary are going to be the most important scientists in the next 50 years in terms of saving Africa. So this great green wall across Africa is to build a wall of 15 kilometers wide and 7,000 kilometers across Africa. So there are four elements of the regeneration of Africa. The four elements of the regeneration of Africa is reforestation of Africa with the great green wall. And our leaders, when they go to these COP meetings, they talk about they need a hundred billion dollars per year for planting trees in Africa. I say, what? Why can't you use the money that you have in the banks overseas and bring it back and employ the millions of African youth who are unemployed and have their plant trees? So Mr. Vice Chancellor, right up what you've done, you took those bundles from Common Earth Hall and you took them out on a Saturday morning <laughs> to plant trees. Let us take the young people all over Africa to plant trees. Water harvesting and storage, irrigation, and the integrated canal system. This is what our research has been on and we are planning to build eight major canals in Africa to change Africa. There's not enough time to go into that in this lecture. As I said, on November 16, we'll give a larger lecture on the water system, on this impact of this water system in Africa. Because what people do not know is why we have this issue of shortage of water and the drying of Lake Chad. Africa has vast oceans of water underneath Africa. Lake Chad itself, which is drying up, is sitting on one of the biggest oceans of water. The newborn aquifer between Chad, Sudan, Egypt, and Libya is one of the largest bodies of water in the world. And guess what? The Libyans were planning to harvest this water. And to harvest this water, they were going to build the great man-made river. And guess what? When they overthrew Gaddafi, they bombed the factory of the great man-made river. <laughs> Most of you don't know this. Because France has its eyes on African water. This water on the Africa. France, the French water company, sees this as 
the future of Europe. And so we are Pan-Africanists, we talk no, we are being Ghanaians or being Kenyans. <laughs> the aquifers, this map of the aquifers across Africa, these aquifers do not recognize boundaries. These aquifers do not require, and for us to plant trees and to get water in Africa, we have to move from neoliberalism. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, in Nigeria, they had a tree planting exercise. They wanted to plant a lot of trees because if you go to Nigeria, you will see the conditions of the society. What use it is to plant trees? And after you plant the trees, people go and dump garbage there. <laughs> or you give it over to, 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 to developers. So we cannot have neoliberalism with planting trees. We must plant trees to understand the power of the trees. Like I said, Vice Chancellor, I really want to big you up as you say in the Rastafari language. <laughs> because we want to make the University of Ghana a green university, not in terms of greenwashing. And when the Chief Justice came to my house on Tuesday night and he walked out and says, what a tree you have out here. This is just so magnificent. Because when you come from society, you go to the University of Lomé, you go to the University of Dakar, you can compare them to this university. So that let us celebrate the trees because in those trees is where our spirits are alive, our, our, our ancestors have been meeting under those trees and those trees have memories of our history. <laughs> when I was in the University of Diffa, uh, the University of Diffa doesn't even have a building. Diffa is one of those towns in Niger. We met the young scientists. And what was amazing was the knowledge of these young scientists about African trees and the trees that are needed to be planted to replenish and regenerate Africa. And this tree called Balatinus Egypti, this tree is a multi-purpose tree. And the, the young man can tell us so much about what this tree does. And he says that if the the roots of two trees are close enough together, one of them is dying, then the other tree will help to regenerate this tree. I said, well, why is it that we don't have this knowledge and we share this knowledge all around us? Because we want to join up with the people of Latin America. Let me move to our conclusion. Because the regeneration of Africa is not an African project. It's a project of the earth. It's a project of linking up with the indigenous people in terms of their knowledge of the earth. We, in 2010, they established in Bolivia a climate justice tribunal. And they said the poor countries should receive various forms of compensation because the indigenous people, like the African people, have a different approach to life and to nature. And in the Pan-African movement, as I've said in many of our lectures, what we want, very simple, we want peace. We want to live. We want health. And we want a planet Earth. To do this, we cannot do this in the old Pan-African way. We have to have a Pan-African movement of movements. We have to have a Pan-African movement for peace. We have to have a Pan-African movement for life. Of course, there is a big dispute about what constitutes life. Look at Ray Kurzweil and those who are developing life in terms of singularity and in the in developing the of computers will tell us that they can life. So African women and men have a view of how we are going to preserve ourselves as human beings. The Pan-African movement for health and Pan-African movement for the planet Earth. So the old Pan-Africanism that is concerned about the state and state power is concerned about 
carry on what was done before and intensifying what has gone on before. We are past that. And we hope that this is what we will leave in the University of Ghana. We will leave this because we are at a new stage. When I was preparing my PowerPoint to come here, and I woke up this morning and I'm going through the PowerPoint again, the screen flashed before me. A uh, statement says, trees constitute 37% of the earth. What it is, the artificial intelligence from Google was penetrating what I was doing to direct me in my research. <laughs> this is what we call brain hacking. <laughs> this is the new stage that we're at in terms of human society. And Africans have to understand why we have to fight for cyber democracy and information freedom. And the Pan-African movement, as we talked about in Wakanda, we have to talk about how we must master African languages, because it's African languages that have the cognitive ideas and notions to guard our spirituality from this materialism. Some of them are 
2,000 years old. And recently, they found that these trees have been dying. Here you have something that took 2,000 years. And the Boba tree, it has more than 300 different remedies. The Boba tree, they use the leaves, it's rich in all kinds of nutrition. Locally, the fruit pulp is made into juice and jam. And they go to Senegal, they sell us that nice juice made from the barbara tree. The flowers are edible, the roots can be used. The barbara tree is not only used for humans, there are ecosystems in African dry areas. Keep the soil conditions humid. Favorite nutrient recycling avoids soil erosion. Now the barbara the tree is dying. That's where we are. This is where progress has given us the barbara tree. I'm going to end by calling on us to go back to the revolutionaries. Revolutionary Thomas Sankara said we must dare to invent the future. We must break from imperial domination. We cannot repair Africa without empowering African women and eradicating corruption. I want to thank all of you for your attention. I want to thank you for bearing with me. And I want to say that yesterday when the, the form of Chief Justice of Kenya came and spoke, he talked about how we can open a Pan-African Jurisprudence Research Center. Now we want to open a Pan-African Regeneration Center in the University of Ghana. <laughs> Regenerating Africa is regenerating ourselves. Rastafari.
to show that if the current warming trend continues, some parts of Africa will be habitable, and even the areas of Central Africa with excellent water and trees will become close to the desert. The concept of global warming. I know exactly that and I feel exactly that too. Because after my PhD, I decided to go and live in one of those countries. Up there in Niger, Agadez. Very hot desert. No trees, no water, but human beings have survived. That was where I learned to drink my own urine to survive. Before I came down here. Now, which way we look at this as Africans? Whether the climate is warming, whether it's becoming cold, whether we are experiencing hurricane, tsunami. My biggest question is how are we going to survive in any of these conditions? How are we going to survive when temperatures go up? How are we going to cope? If temperatures drop to minus 10 degrees, how are we going to cope? If we are swept away by the tsunamis, the earthquakes, and all that, what will be our coping mechanism? The second point is that so defending the rights of motherhood is the most important human rights and social justice struggle. And this is where probably we do not realize as Africans. Because we've taken all that's around us for granted. Planetary transformation. Are we ready to embark on that kind of transformation? Ecological collapse, you make mention of it. Why is our ecology collapsing? Pollution of our continent. Are we looking back? Are we blaming someone? Personally, I think it's self-inflicted. And it has to do with our attitudes as, as, as Africans. He spoke about the concept of Ubuntu. Sympathy for humanity, love, selflessness, doing what you have to do to help humanity and make sure that you prepare a better future for posterity. This has tremendous effect on our economy and the way we grow our nations here in Africa. We have destroyed our environment. Come to think of it. He spoke about the entire biosphere. The atmosphere, the earth. Look at our water bodies. We have destroyed everything. Just because of greed. What? I can find for myself, so I'm called a rich person without thinking about what the entire millions of people will lose as Africans. And so if we have destroyed our water waters, our lands are gone. Now, where is the arable land? For us to cultivate our crops. Where is the water for precipitation? And he was talking about irrigation. And all that. Where do we find the water? Even to drink. What kind of legacy are we leaving for those yet unborn? The first thing I heard when I went to Israel is that every single tree here was planted. Every single tree in Israel was planted. So I was made to plant trees. When I went to Israel, in general, 
We have all the trees. We don't seem to know the uses of trees. Even as therapy for our own selves. How therapy? And God gave all these to us. It's for no reason that when He created the garden of Eden, He asked Adam and Eve to be there. And the garden was full of trees. So you're talking about the flowers. You're talking about the antioxidants. The volatiles, the minerals. Just walk through the garden and inhale them. And you are killed. We're destroying everything that comes our way. Our soils are full of plastics. Over 90%.
the upper post relations with everyone that is standing here. And I really want to thank you for the support that you give. And my partner and I, we will cherish the time we spent here. And as you said, it is for life because we intend to work very closely with the Institute of African Studies to carry out your mission to be a first class institute for research in African Studies and Pan Africans. Thank you so much.
all of you for coming.